Okay, take it away. All right. I think we have Marty, are you going to ask a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask this yeah, question go for it. To, to Alex. Uh, um, uh, two questions, but I can't remember the second one. So the, the, first, <laughs> the first question is, uh, uh, have, have you or anyone studied people who have had fecal transplants that failed and to look at the composition of the failed donor microbiota and to compare that with the successful microbiota? Okay. Um, that overlaps a little bit with the gap that I mentioned. So I, I've done 120 fecal transplants for refractory recurrent C. difficile infection. Um, out of those, we so there's a 90% efficacy rate, which is very good, uh, compared, considering how uh, difficult this condition is. Uh, so that means out of those 120, we have about a dozen failures, and those would be a wonderful group to study had we anticipated that we need to propose a study for that many patients. You know, I believe that every patient walks in, gets something like this done, or walks into the academic health center, should be part of the subject, should be part of a research study, so some material should be saved, and to go back, but we just didn't have the resources to collect everybody on that scale. So at this point, yes, I wish we had. Now, we, I did show one on the slide. We did have one failure uh, there, and it seemed like it was poor engraftment. There was uh, a still a, a big proteobacteria fraction there. Um, that, uh, that particular patient got treated with the same donor material and did fine. Um, there, there, there may be could, multiple factors. Sure, we we sure, studied sure. the households of these people, for example, uh, and they're universally contaminated with C. diff. Yeah, yeah, they that, they that, live that in this. Isn't the, that isn't the question. The question okay. is, what's the difference in the microbiota between the successful donor and the failure? And it, certainly, that should be looked at in the future. So, Marty, yeah. I can add two. Marty is over here. I can add one microbiologic failure, but not symptomatic. In other words, a patient who continued to shed C. diff, but didn't, uh, but was still, was still shedding, but was not symptomatic, not having diarrhea, and one where there was a clinical sort of failure. And these are samples that I got from Johann Bach and Johannes Oss. And those still had that proteobacteria dominance in there. So again, that's an N of three out of how many but again, is that cause or effect? Is that just a marker that there's still C. diff there? It's still dysbiotic? Is that just a marker of dysbiosis, or is that responsible for the no, fact? No, that my question is about the donor. The oh, question about the is, donors. Is, is the the don family. those two donors looked fine. Yeah, but maybe some it was the recipient. They didn't gra and graph the same thing. The detailed informatics could um, identify something that's missing. So clinically, we've used majority of our cases just two donors. And the success rate of the, in the failure of doing the repeat procedure is still 90%. Yeah, so, yeah, so, that, so you have two very good donors. So now I remember my other question. <laughs> uh, uh, and that is that the literature says that about 3% of adults are carrying C. diff, but 100% of babies in their first year of life have C. diff, or some very high percentage of babies. So the question is, what happens to the C. diff uh, from baby to adulthood and where are those babies getting their 100% C. diff from? I'm not sure I know the answer, but, but uh, you know, it, it seems to be squeezed out as, as, they, as they mature. The babies are not symptomatic. There's really not much C. diff associated disease in the first year of life. Um, yeah. There is a, a, so, a. So squeezed out makes sense, except then the question is where are they getting it from? Well. There's probably a lot of it around. <laughs> we've, we've gone around and swap places, and we find a lot of it in the, in the environment. Um, and, and it is moving in the environment. It used to be a hospital-associated disease, and as Elaine alluded, you know, they get antibiotics, they get a C-section, that floor may well be contaminated. But we've gone to the homes of people with recurrent disease, and they are universally contaminated as well. So, and 50% of C. diff today is acquired in the community. Okay, um, question over that? Yes, I uh, hate to have the uh, fecal transplant dominate, but uh, they're, they're obviously a, a very hot topic. So the discussion today revolved around replacing a, a totally disrupted microbiota, but there's great enthusiasm for at least the potential 
of therapeutic tre fecal transplant with dysbiosis. So uh, does, do, do you or anyone else on the podium have thoughts on how one might prepare uh, a patient with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, other dysbiotic conditions, obesity, whatever, how one might clear the uh, existing organisms to best uh, have a niche to, to have a hope of, a, of an effective uh, uh, replacement. Um, you know, it's an entirely different situation in my mind than trying to complement uh, something that used to, you know, replace something that used to be there rather than totally uh, replace an existing uh, microbiota, knowing that it's less diverse than, than, than the norm, but still a lot of niches are, are covered. Right, and then that is exactly the uh, the next thing that we would like to do. I think there are, last count, 12 ongoing trials for ulcerative colitis with fecal transplant, and they're they're to my knowledge they're not taking into account the, this this question. So doing a fecal transplant for C diff is like doing a bone marrow transplant after a Hiroshima. Right. Uh, the patients are naturally conditioned by the radiation in that case. All they need is some stem cells. These sedative patients are exactly the same. They've been carpet bombed with antibiotics for long periods of time. You look at them, there's not only uh, lesser diversity, but there's just fewer bacteria. So the niche is as open as possible. I think it's the closest adult human version of germ-free human <laughs> that, that, that we have. So that just needs to be studied. I, I don't think just putting in poop and thinking you're going to reverse something um, it, it, it sounds too naive. There was a little, I think uh, not a lot, this past DDW, but the one before, there was a European study and a small pilot study in, in IBD, and they didn't see any, any effect of fecal transplant, but they also looked at engraftment, and there was no sustained engraftment either. For, so I, I think we need to explore that. How exactly do you, what antibiotics do you choose for how long? Do you target particular suspected species that may be involved in IBD? Probably not just look at the fecal material, but also look at the, what's in the mucosa, because that may be a more resistant place, as we heard from Sarkis, that bacteria could hide in the, in the, uh, the mucin layer and be undisturbed, et cetera. It needs to be done. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, and, and in my view, the uh, murine studies could actually, you know, uh, preclinical studies in, in mice could actually uh, answer some of those questions rather than uh, human experimentation. Thank you. Gentleman in the middle. Uh, I'm Tonsi Raju from NICHD. It's a great session. Um, getting back to the fecal transplant, uh, transplantation issue, yuck factor, uh, much of it is in the name. So instead of calling fecal transplant, why not we say gut microbiome transplant, or GMT, or something like that? Just, just, just a comment. Right, and, and when I started writing about it, I said it was a gut microbiota transplant. And then we got together with, with a group of people who were doing clinicians and to wrote, write some guidelines. And there was a uniform opposition. They felt patients know what fecal means. It's an honest thing to do. Let's not confuse them, and that's why the fecal word U was, Eurokinase was, is being used just was chosen. I, I'm, I'm trying to get away from that now and to have some sort of center at the university. I don't, I don't want to have a fecal U of M um, <laughs> center, um, <laughs> but the, the name sticks for now. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Yep. I'd like to ask Dr. Blazier if he feels that the use of antibiotics in infants is contributing to the increase in uh, food allergies? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good question. I don't have any data about it, uh, but um, certainly food allergies is one of those diseases that has been ri rising in recent years. Uh, that has to have an environmental factor. We know that the microbiota plays a role in providing context for the developing immune system. So some microbiota effect is good, and one could imagine that antibiotics and other aspects like cesarean sections or cumulative approach could have uh, uh, an impact. And that's the kind of thing that should be looked at in cohort studies. 
Uh, does anybody else have any information about it? Okay. Uh, gentleman in the back. Yeah, sorry if I bring it back to the fecal transplant, <laughs> but um, maybe I can broaden it up a little bit to, to the clinical and, and uh, research side. So um, since th with all this research on the microbiota, the, the idea that we have maybe a method to manipulate the microbiota and make things right again is very exciting. And there's a lot of different initiatives, not just C. diff, where it works really well, but well, there was a study in Europe on obesity. and But there was another study, I think, in the literature that talked about an ulcerative colitis patient that was symptom-free for years and was treated for a C. diff infection and had a UC flare after the fecal transplant, I believe. So I was just wondering what your, your idea is or your perspective. Where, where should this all go from here? Should we keep on trying fecal transplant for all kinds of microbiota associated problems or should we, I mean, we don't really know what's happening yet, right? But it seems to work in many cases or at least have a, an effect. So what do you think where we should go from here? Well, I, I think the, the answer is we need systematic approach and go step by step, uh, perhaps starting with um, the, the question Dr. Balfour asked, you know, how do you actually do it in a non-C. diff case? I also think uh, um, we need to take control of the, of the donor pool, uh, either with uh, what Elaine is doing with uh, actually designing it bottom-up, or if you're starting with, uh, with uh, full-spectrum microbiota, then you have to know everything about those donors. Uh, you, have, you can have, of course, you can do a taxonomic classification of, of what you're actually putting in, but also uh, metabolomics and also donor characteristics, some end product, uh, microbial uh, community end products, fecal gases, whatever. It collect as much information as possible, so you have a panel of biomarkers, and as these things go into different trials, whoever has a passion for a particular disease, we should know everything about the donor as well as learn everything about the recipients because there's a lot of variability there. And I think that's the only way to make progress forward. Until then, we haven't made much progress in this field since 1958. It has remained static. It's been practiced all along the way in, in, on a small scale. The C. diff epidemic made it much bigger. Uh, but it's, we have to look at this as an opportunity to learn a lot about microbial ecology and host physiology and that interaction. I think the, the opportunity is there. And it's one of the challenges and gaps that uh, NIH can help us with. I mean, we, we're focusing a lot on, on replacing bacteria. So we see this biosis, and we think we could replace it uh, with different taxa that could, could protect or, or restore homeostasis. But like Jonathan was pointing out this morning, we need to know more about the physiological action of these bacteria. So if we, if we think about IBD or cancer, is there an activity pr promoted by bacteria that could be blocked or replaced with another activity? Do you really have to start from a complex community and try to put back an environment and a new ecosystem? Or could you just have a function put in back uh, to restore disease, that's where we need to move into more detailed uh, activities. What do the, these bacteria are doing and how do they relate it to health and disease and then come up with a little bit more focused approach. Fecal transplant look like we haven't progressed that much in terms of, 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 of medicine. It's like a little bit of Stone Age. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, we've seen with uh, Ellen Petro that you could, you could narrow it down and then come back with maybe some activities that will refrain C. diff action. And you know, this is where we need to move. That's a great point. Um, gentleman in the middle. Sure. Um, I, I actually have a non-FMT question. Um, uh, one challenge that seems to be emerging for us as a community to deal with um, is uh, we've seen a lot of very interesting data presented over the last couple of days about the impact of antibiotics on microbiome. Um, Dr. Blazer presented some fascinating results today. And I guess I'd like to ask the question, especially since Dr. Goodman is here, um, is, is 
uh, how is the FDA and also how should we as a community be having a conversation not just about how we should be thinking about safety and regulation of potential microbial-based therapeutics, but of antibiotics themselves? <clears throat> well, I think that um, understanding that antibiotics have more than potential acute side effects and benefits is a, is a really important conceptual leap that understanding the microbiome better helps us make. Uh, I think we need a lot more data to understand what those effects may or may not be because, you know, right now there's also a lot of people who die because they don't have antibiotics. So I think it's a complex issue. It should certainly make society, we have a lot of good reasons to reduce the unnecessary use of antibiotics in our society without any of this information about the microbiome. So I think it really, some of these concerns should really add impetus to that movement. Um, and I get back to, I think we need science, such as people here are trying to do to understand where bacteria are good, where they're bad. And some of the, I, I was interested that in some of the studies presented, for example, the use of an antibiotic uh, created what seemed to be a healthy phenotype, for example, with respect to carnitine, uh, et cetera. So I think it's, it, antibiotics perturb a complex ecosystem and the effects are going to be complex and not always predictable and they do clearly have a role in saving many people from life-threatening infections. But I think it's a blunt instrument, and people have thought of it uh, as a very finely tuned instrument, and it, it, it really isn't. It's a blunt instrument because it, we think of it just treating the pathogen, but it's obviously also dramatically affecting the host in, in other ways. Um, and I, I also think Again, there were plenty of other reasons for doing it, but I think Marty may have mentioned this. To me, it's another reason to point us in the direction of uh, more targeted antibiotics, narrower spectrum antibiotics. Uh, but I will say, frankly, to do that, we also need a model, for example, of reimbursement and healthcare behavior and improved diagnostics that will let clinicians responsibly uh, use narrow spectrum antibiotics. So uh, to me, it's very exciting because it lends weight to something that I've been passionate about for a long time is that antibiotics are a very important tool and we should really optimize how we use them and not use them when we don't need them and use them properly when we do need them. Okay, try to move that. Oh, did, did you want to respond to that? I just wanted to, con to perhaps continue this discussion a little bit. Sure. I mean, the, the, the data, like Dr. Blazer presented, look very convincing that, you know, there's correlative data uh, linking for obesity and antibiotic use, and there is great animal data. At what point does the FDA come out at least warn the pediatric population with a little black box warning that there are potential risks that are still unknown? <laughs> I mean, I think you need some pretty credible data, and, you know, at this point I would focus more on this as part of educating physicians about prudent and responsible use of antibiotics. We do, by the way, we did introduce labeling that does pertain to the inappropriate use of antibiotics. Uh, potentially leading to resistance. Uh, we did this, um, you know, quite some time ago, but so the FDA has taken a position on the label about appropriate use of antibiotics. But there's not something magical that the label on an FDA product does. As you know, they can be difficult to read. Uh, they're technical. You know, what we're really talking about is a healthcare technology and tool um, that is, like many others, has appropriate uses and inappropriate uses, and I think it's also our responsibility as a medical community. There's also not a lot of science that helps us know how 
best to use some antibiotics. So I think it's a broad issue, but if evidence develops that you know, there is harm to children that needs to be balanced with benefit, um, then that's the appropriate time uh, to look at that kind of thing. Um, just before we take that question, um, is the person in, from, who asked uh, a question from the first day about probiotics and regulation of health claims around those or lack thereof still here? Did you want to? Did you want to ask that question again? Because it just seems relevant yeah. to. The where Where is the hype? I mean, we see commercials daily on TV for probiotics, and where, how do we separate the hype from the reality and the promise of them? I think that's a, a major issue because the public is going to be thinking they do things that they may not do, and yet uh, there can be significant advantages in, in the right situations. Well, I would say that's why we need sound science and clinical trials in some of these areas where the use is being promoted. And, um, you know, I, I also think the scientific community, I was a couple of times struck um, by, you know, I think in general people have had a very measured approach to their data, but there are a few times where people, even in this meeting, showed this study or that, and, you know, uh, there's an inference about something like autism or whatever. I think the scientific community in our excitement about some of the data and some of the associations we see needs to be very, very careful uh, not, not sort of to send patients down a, a road that could be potentially uh, harmful to them uh, or maybe, you know, at best just might not be the right road to help them when they have a desperate problem. And again, I'm really enthused, you know, and I, I heard from some components of NIH that there are a number of studies starting to be done in these areas to really address where, you know, do probiotics have effects in some of the areas that they've been shown uh, potential promise. Um, you know, and as I think I had said earlier in response to questions, you know, it's the, the what FDA's role is in probiotics is sort of determined by the authority uh, FDA has been given. And if a manufacturer makes a disease claim, uh, then that becomes uh, a drug claim in essence, and they really have to provide evidence to support that. But short of that is where sometimes confusion uh, develops. So I think the the community has to be, the science community and the clinical community should be very, pe people are intelligent. Um, and I think if they hear from responsible physicians and scientists that we see promise here, but what the reality is about the gaps in the data and what's not known about many of these products, at least they can make informed decisions. And most importantly is when we reach that threshold for a clinical trial, something makes sense, there's promising data, there's a defined product, then for important public health needs, uh, hopefully begin to get that kind of information. Great. Patient, patient desperation is a big force in, in driving them to alternative medicine. I'm not saying probiotic is alternative medicine, I'm just saying that it's an easy, the way the claim is put put to them, it's an easy uh, uh, potential treatment for them, and uh, it's 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 the wild west, that's for sure. And the claim just came going up. Okay. We, you know, I will say we recently took action on, for example, people may have seen a diabetes issue where some supplements were being claimed to uh, benefit in treatment of diabetes and. Obviously, that's something where we do have medicine where it is a potentially fatal or unstable disorder, and that's where we would you know, normally prioritize limited resources in terms of going after concerns that might really endanger people. So I think there's a question, I think maybe more for NIH or maybe a comment, and uh, maybe David can uh, comment on this as well when I'm done, but uh, one of the challenges that I face working on probiotics or even trying to develop next generation probiotics from uh, the gut microbiota is that 
there, there really isn't a study section for me to send my grants to at this point. Um, most microbial research at NIH is uh, focused on pathogens. The only microbial physiology study sections that's left is now called uh, PCMB. There used to be two study sections that's collapsed into one, and so I find it really difficult uh, to figure out where to send a grant unless there's an RFA or a specific call for uh, beneficial microbes. So I would uh, implore NIH to try to figure out how to take uh, at least this big program that we have and maybe uh, have a study section that allows for R01s that are specific. And I, I just want to point out, David made uh, some really important points today. One is that the strain specificity of activities is really dramatic. So just knowing what a 16S sequence is is not going to tell you what that bacterium is going to do. Uh, and David really nicely highlighted that. And that's where I think the need for microbial physiologists, microbial geneticists, and a mechanism to study these bugs without necessarily having to have a big focus on a disease and a grant is really critical. Um, again, self-serving, this is what I do, but I, I, I do it because I believe so strongly in it. Um, and so uh, I don't know if David wants to comment on that or uh, anybody else does, but I think that that's going to be critical moving forward. Um, can we get a microphone to David? And does anyone from NIH want to respond? Well, I want to, I want to say it's not self-serving because it's what I do too. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, NCAM is is where we we've been submitting, and there really isn't a, a spot unless you partner with somebody and you're addressing some other issue, and so you become a tag along on a uh, on another grant. So it would be nice if there was. Is this on? Mm -hmm. but it would be nice if there's a focus uh, uh, on these organisms. I wanted to actually amplify what you said before, and that in addition to strain specificity is this issue of genetics. We have a lot of organisms that we're investing a fair amount of money in clinical trials in, uh, or NIHs in terms of probiotics, that we, in so many, many cases, we don't have genetic systems for it all. And so the ability to try to get down to a mechanistic level so you know which genes are turning on what mechanism, it becomes impossible unless you have decent genetic systems, and, it, and you can't write, as, as Rob pointed out before, that kind of grant. Uh, and so there's a tool development aspect that's desperately needed. We, we have done lots of mechanistic work on Bifidobacterium infantis. We have yet to knock out a gene. Um, you know, we do what we can, uh, but, it, but the tools don't exist, and, and it really hampers the research moving forward. So that would be another area that, that I would also amplify as well. Thank you. Any other responses to that? Okay. Gentlemen in the middle. Okay. I have some uh, questions here. Uh, the topic of uh, self-administered fecal transplants has certainly been uh, brought up, and I know somewhat controversial. Um, certainly I understand the concerns, although um, um, I run a website, get lots and lots of questions from various people out there, and one of the questions was, um, what can people do if they're doing these outside of uh, a clinical setting to, um, I guess, do them in a way that would be uh, best, uh, basically safe and um, effective? Because I know for many people, I, I wasn't even aware until today um, that you were doing these and had such a standardized process set up. So many people aren't aware that there's access to these types of things. Um, for people doing it in a non-clinical setting, what would be some recommendations to make sure that they're safe and effective and conform to standard medical guidelines? Is that a question for me or for the FDA? <laughs> um, that, well, that's a question for yeah, question for you. Um, well, I, I guess I, we have standardized and we're material and we're trying to work on it. It's not, uh, it's not a approved, licensed. It's not ready for distribution to anybody, and, and certainly there's a lot of uh, resources that went into that setup. So that material hopefully will go through a series of trials and will be reviewed and hopefully make it to a licensed product and then it will become a lot more available to physicians anywhere to administer in an easier fashion than this is done currently. Um, I don't have a particular, I, I do get emails like yours, can you help me with some technical tips on how to do this, and I'm going to do this anyway, and I'm placed in this um, position because the, a lot of these stories are really heart-wrenching and 
and these people are really are suffering, and you want to listen, and you want to make sure they don't do something that is uh, completely crazy, or if you read something in their email that just doesn't sound right, and I kind of point it out, but uh, I don't give out advice on solve to do home transplants because that's just uh, too far removed from from the patient. I mean, I, I, for me to treat a patient, I have to see the patient, I have to do the physical exam, I have to form that doctor-patient relationship. If it doesn't exist, that's whatever. You know, it's, it's not exactly uh, professional advice at that point. So I try to draw that line. But it's a challenge with every with every email. Where exactly do you find that that line? Or if you feel there's something that you think is, is potential harm, you have to probably step in, but step back and not encourage something that you have no control over. Do we have another question of that? So speaking of understudied aspects and standardization, I was wondering if you guys have thought about characterizing the phage in the fecal transplant material, or in general, that's something we haven't really talked about, aside from Rick Bushman's talk about phage. I've thought about it during this meeting, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing to characterize, we haven't looked at fungi, we haven't looked at archaea, we, we, we just looked at bacteria so far, but all, all of those are interesting questions. And phage is probably important to the stability and right, behavior of the microbial community. Is Rick still here? No, I think he just left. Okay. Um, so I, I just wanted to um, address a question that came in through uh, the emails that we've been receiving which um, changes the topic slightly. A few of you um, I've spoken to about um, the, the issue of evolution. We've uh, talked about a lot about dynamics and uh, descriptive studies. Um, and a few people have mentioned the evolutionary context of the microbiome. But um, this question says, um, we, we throw around the term of uh, co-evolved microbiome. But I think a grand challenge for us as a field is to establish what this means um, and how we might prove or disprove this claim. I think we need to look more, much more at conserved functions uh, rather than hosts in their, uh, that uh, the hosts and their microbes perform for each other and evidence for selection on these traits rather than just focusing on phylogenies and this will require broad comparative studies across many host species rather than just humans and their cl close relatives. Does anyone have any response to that? I mean obviously <laughs> evolution has a way to select for the microorganism that you need. I mean, if you uh, eliminate a uh, group of microorganisms because you evolve in a new environment, but you conserve, you know, the activities are conserved in some ways, but the taxa is gone because another one could take the same function. Uh, this, is, this is a dynamic selection that happened. Uh, we, we, we heard from, from ancestral community that uh, we have quite a different microbiome. And, uh, but we live in a different environment. We, we, we said that all these function that we have right now with these microbes are uh, well suited for our lifestyles. I mean, we have disease associated with, with some microbial dysfunction. Is it, is it because we are evolving in a, in a more harsh environment than, than, than ancestral community? Likely, but the evolution is, is, is I think, a fa an, an, an action that is happening from your environment. Uh, it will be, I don't, I don't see a, a problem in making the evolution of microorganism selection with, uh, with how, you know, co-housing and co-existing. Yeah, so I w um, what I would say is that we know a lot about how pathogens have co-evolved with, uh, with hosts, uh, but there's been very few studies, I think, that have looked at commensals. So I, I would point you to one paper from Jens Walter's labs at, uh, at the University of Nebraska where they actually looked at lactobacillus reuteri distribution across uh, a lot of different vertebrate animals all the way from uh, turkeys up through humans. And uh, the strains actually uh, track nicely. They, they group together based on uh, their animal uh, host. Uh, and so uh, I expect we'll see more studies like that coming out as we start being able to culture. And, and that does raise the point that we do have to look at other animals other than just humans, which hasn't really been part of HMP yet. So. Yeah. And just adding to that about the co-evolution, you know, there's another study out of David Relman's group where um, I think it was a cell paper last year where they took uh, mouse microbes and put it into germ-free mice, and then human microbes and put it into germ-free mice. And they actually saw there was uh, less T cells in the intestinal compartment of these mice. So it, they kind of pointed to the fact that maybe there is some sort of co-evolution that you have with your gut microbes over time. 
Um, and uh, you know, this could be kind of due to some sort of host factors and colonization factors that the host has. And uh, our lab has seen similar things when we've come in with trying to humanize germ-free mice. You see they, they become some, somewhat immunodeficient um, and they don't actually, there's no particular components in the immune system that can actually recognize the microbes. So that's maybe another kind of paper um, similar to that as well, it might be. Okay. Actually, um, th so I had a question for David that was along similar lines. Your um, studies with uh, milk glycans, um, have you looked at uh, the relationships between uh, the effects that those have on microbiomes in um, other mammal species, or has anyone else, th do we have any other data on that? Um, human milk glycans are kind of hard to get a lot of, and so, we, yeah, we haven't really been able to take large quantities and put them elsewhere. Uh, if you look across animals, you can look at the, gly the milk glycomes across different animals. And actually, none of them are as complex as human. Human has a, has a large number uh, by comparison even to, to lower primates. Um, but we, we, we start to see the same trends across different animals. And so it's clear that these are, are selective across different animals, but they're selective in different ways. And one of the ways that, that it, it sort of follows what, what uh, uh, Rob was saying about uh, Jens Walter's work, which is really wonderful work in addressing this evolutionary question. Uh, we've isolated the bifidobacteria uh, longum from monkeys and from cows and sequenced their genomes, and it doesn't have all the glycolytic capacity that the ones we get from humans have, uh, which, which makes a certain amount of sense matching to the glycome, the milk glycome of that particular animal. But that's just early, early data. Uh, and so one would imagine that it tracks, but we have to play it out. Okay. Um, there's no one standing for a mic. So am I taking it that there aren't any further questions? I want to ask kind of a crazy question. <laughs> okay. It's your prerogative leader as so, organizer. So, no, no, not that crazy. But sort of taking a lesson from the FMT talks, David's talk, and, and, and Julian's call for important metabolites, is there any, has anybody tried to do experiments with the fecal water or the, you know, we always target the microbes in the stool, right? But is there, any, is there anything of benefit that can be learned from looking at the, the fecal water, the metabolites in the stool? Are there any important beneficial compounds or anything that people have tried to explore? It's just an open-ended question. Anybody in the, in the audience? Or we just throw away all that stuff and just keep the microbes? John Braun is gone, but his, the studies he showed this morning were on fecal water. Uh, he has this cool oh, right. way of, uh, in, in the rectum, inserting a sponge and actually soaking up mm -hmm. the free fluid and then does metabolomic analysis uh, mm -hmm. on that. Uh, and he's compared mucosal uh, uh, kind of luminal fecal uh, that's not really fecal water, but that's, you know, luminal water. Mm -hmm, uh, right. But I would imagine the same concept to be amenable to fecal water. It's just that some of the metabolites are volatile and, sure. you know, aren't, the, get them in source maybe better than in a stored sample. And, that, and that's one of the challenges is, you know, how, how to collect metabolomic uh, data, uh, materials for metabolomic uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. How long, how do you store it? How do you, how do you collect it? How do you process right. it? How do you store it? How long can, can it go? Great, and what about, uh, I don't know, any prebiotic properties or anything in that material? Do you know anything about that? Oh, here's somebody in the back, do you know? No, oh, oh, different uh, question. Quite, uh, an answer to yours. Oh, oh, got it, yeah. okay, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. one of you. From that? Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for John, but I, sure. I, I think that, that certainly the, the proteomic side of this, it needs to be compared with the proteomics at the same time to see mm -hmm. what residual, well, that actually wouldn't be proteomics because those are carbohydrates right, in, right. in general. So I, I would think that that would be part of the metabolomic analysis, although they're usually looking at products rather than residual substrates. Okay, thank you. In answer to your question um, regarding studies of specific metabolites, our, I'm a director of a group in Canada that's looking at short-chain fatty acids, the simple um, metabolites, propionate, acetate, and butyrate, which have been talked about a lot in, in the talks with, <coughs> pardon me, beneficial properties, cholesterol lowering, uh, and, and in low amounts, very useful. But from our approach, we've 
taken propionic acid, which is interesting because it's a main metabolite of autism-associated uh, bacteria, clostridial populations. So the models we've been using in an animal model, and also clinical, we found that these compounds, as a, a bit of a worry, they're beneficial in some ways, but small amounts given in, at particular times of development cause autism-associated hyperactivity, antisocial behavior, effects in lipids, gene expression, and mitochondrial function. So that's, that was a good point about translational cleaner studies using a, simple metabolites that we take for granted. But again, it's a caveat where you have compounds that seem to be beneficial uh, in terms, as I mentioned, in low amounts, coloprotective, lowering cholesterol, talked about as a, an appetite suppressant. And actually, I would note with propion, it also uses a food preservative in, 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 at the wrong time or in the wrong place can lead to autism-associated features. And these are good points, too. The other really excellent work that's suggesting, um, e even though it may be against, at one level, what we're doing, using, anti using vaccines against autism-associated bacteria, uh, clostridial-associated ones, it's a very intriguing possibility, and it's partly what we're looking at in Canada. But as, a, 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 again, a caveat, some of these clostridial populations early on in development are actually very good. They're the bacteria that seem to promote catecholamine development. It's almost like the microbiome is jump-starting brain and cardiovascular function because mm -hmm. a lot of preemie babies don't have any bugs and they look hypotensive. So, you know, meetings like this are great in terms of finding potential risks and benefits. Carnitine was discussed as well, but again, it's the caveat of trying to do good translational science to show some things are good in some patients and maybe bad in others. Thank you. Um, one more comment over there. Oh, I was just going to add to Lita's. When we do our human fresh fecal collections, um, we usually have to get those within 15 minutes because someone already mentioned the volatile short chain fatty acids. If you can't get those acidified, they're, you know, floating away, so moving into the metabolon and um, those kind of data sources. So just making sure you're moving and processing those samples very quickly. Otherwise, you know, the translation of that data, it, they're just floating away essentially. What you can smell is part of the reason when you're doing the fecal collections. And then phenols and indols, you can measure those. Someone was speaking about tryptophan metabolism. You know, in humans, higher protein diets associated with, you know, higher phenols and indols because remember, in humans, we're very heterogeneous and we all eat very different diets and so we've got you know different bacterial populations in our colon because of what we're feeding them and so you know makes it difficult to measure that as well but we have some PCA um, analysis with um, one of the posters that was here and was in Journal of Nutrition with um, George Fahey and Kelly Swanson is some of the groups that will do those things in humans. Thank you. Okay, just so one quick question and then another one of that. Um, you mentioned there are 12, I believe, uh, 12 current studies of uh, fecal transplant use for ulcerative colitis. Um, can you briefly expound a little bit on um, a little bit about some of those studies? Oh, this is just a catalog of things that are listed on clinicaltrials.gov around the world. Okay. Um, so there's, I mean, the, most of them are just toxicity studies to see if it does any flares. And certainly in ulcerative colitis, there is a real concern that doing that because you don't have a, a protected barrier, uh, epithelial barrier that, that could actually could trigger a flare uh, of ulcerative colitis. And, and um, I think those kinds of things should really be done under very, very, very close supervision because of that. Um, are there any studies then um, basically uh, using anti-inflammatory drugs or other drugs to restore the barrier as much as possible in preparation for fecal transplant? maybe say making sure that uh, immunosuppressives or other drugs are used before and maybe during the fecal transplants. Do you know of any studies that are currently doing that? I don't know those details. Okay. Okay, um, question over there. Okay. So just going back to Alita's question, um, just putting in a plug for the RoboGuts for you because we've been doing a little bit of stuff on fecal water essentially. Uh, looking for metabolites in fecal water is tricky because it's just so complex and everyone is so different. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do is standardize it a little bit. 
by taking samples from the RoboGuard. Now that has a benefit, so this would be for any chemostat kind of study, so it would be equally applicable to the sort of things that, that Rob's doing too. Uh, but the real benefit of that is that uh, a lot of metabolites are rapidly absorbed by the host. Yeah. And if you have an in vitro system that is made of glass, you're not gonna get that absorption, so you're perhaps gonna see some of those uh, metabolites a bit better. Plus you can much more strongly control for what you're putting in and the effects that, that, might, uh, that, that you might have. So we've been collecting all of our uh, Elaine called it waste. We call it liquid gold. We keep it, <laughs> and uh, we have uh, we have a whole repository of this stuff. Uh, it's different uh, between different people. We're starting to do some um, proton NMR stuff on it now, and um, that was really tricky at first because when you try and do that with fecal water, you get a mess. But when you do it with chemostat liquid waste, you can really start to pick out some patterns. And so I think that's probably where some effort needs to be expended. And let me just ask the kind of connecting question. There's no way that the fecal water in the absence of the microbes could be beneficial to treating any of these patients. Um, that's something that we want to look at. Yes, I think that that would be a really uh, useful way of looking at things because then you're taking a live organism out of yeah. the picture yeah. and making it a lot more controllable. Right. And there's definitely some work going on in my lab and other labs where that's, uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do. But it is really like pulling needles out of haystacks. It's, yeah. uh, it's really Thank tricky you. to do. Well, if, if our hypothesis is correct, and there, as I said, there could be multiple others. It could be secondary bile acids in fecal water, maybe uh, what right. actually fecal transplant does. Right, right, right. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, comment over that? Um, I just wanted to speak back to uh, the fact that a couple of questions and issues have been brought up about review over the course of the meeting, and um, they were met with kind of a resounding silence from program officers through, from the various institutes, and there's a reason for that. There's also, um, I'm still sitting down because I'm trying to stay under the radar, but we don't have anybody from Center for Scientific Review here. I want to remind all of you that they review the bulk of the investigator applications that come in. It, the institutes don't really have much to do with that, but they do have ongoing um, reorganizations, they look at science as it changes, and I think the way to reach the attention of the Center for Scientific Review is for large groups of people like this to get together, the scientists, the investigators, universities, academic societies, contact them on a large scale level, and I'm not talking thousands, but certainly more than an individual investigator to let them know of your concerns. I think if you get their attention, that will make a difference. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hi, this is a question for Eric. Um, I've been sitting struggling with a little bit of an intellectual conundrum um, from one of the stories you told. And um, yesterday, um, Maria Domingos Bello told you know, a very beautiful story looking at comparisons of the diversity and composition of microbiomes from more Western microbiomes to the sort of more ancestral state in the um, Indians in Venezuela. And in those populations, they're having, in many cases, a higher diversity of microorganisms and a different composition from our Western microbiomes. Um, however, adhering to our sort of our Western diet and Western lifestyles, we tend to have higher incidences of you know, immune problems and, and GI problems that aren't necessarily witnessed in more of these third world situations. But you were telling sort of vignettes about how um, vaccines have decreased efficacy in those types of environments. Is, can you think of a way to reconcile that? Yeah, well, I, I don't think diversity can actually explain all of it. Um, so the, yeah, there is increased uh, uh, gut diversity in these areas of the world. Um, and I think what you maybe were confused about too is uh, the paper I presented from Claire Fraser and Marcelo Stein where they showed increased diversity of microbiota actually helped the cell mediated responses. But I think you can't just view it through a diversity issue. Um, I mean, obviously you need a diverse microbiota to stimulate the immune system. But I think in you know, regards to the Venezuelan study and, and that, there's all kinds of uh, you know, other effects um, such as parasites um, which can shift your microbiota and you know, really can dampen some immune responses um, and of course um, exposure to like more environmental antigens. So yeah, I think it's just much more of a complex issue that you can't just start tying like just diversity but maybe you know, other aspects of their gut physiology. Um, you know, there's some sort of asymptomatic um, gastrointestinal issues a lot of these um, children have when they're raised in these areas. Uh, like 
uh, such as environmental enteropathy, which is sort of this subclinical disorder of the gut, um, where they get this flattening of the villi and like less and malabsorption, basically less nutrient uptake. And we're kind of thinking of maybe that's w one of the reasons uh, that this uh, reduced vaccine efficacy is actually sort of more of a, a physiological gut response to uh, to the microbes. So, yeah, thanks. All right, we are pretty much. Uh, do you, one last quick question. We've got two no, minutes. I, I was going to follow up on Lita's question. I, I think that's an important point to, um, especially in the context of the fecal transplant, we're focusing a lot on the living bacteria, but either I'm not aware or there's not much, re much research on whether you really need the living bacteria or whether there might be some interactions happening between bacterial components and the host that might be responsible for a lot of the effects we see. So I, I, I think it's an interesting question. I would like to know if the people know more about that, whether there could be other factors involved, whether, for example, a fecal transplant with killed cells would still have potentially a healing effect, or maybe even in other contexts, which would get around of a, lot, a lot of the problems that we see that maybe we're establishing a wrong microbiota in the patient, which we would not have to if it's just about triggering some response through, through um, parts of the cell that don't require living. Bacteria. Okay, any quick responses to that? Uh, well, for what it's worth, you know, the way we prepare the uh, donor material is it's, it is washed extensively and most of uh, the fecal material other than the microbial fraction is washed away and that's still the therapeutic part. Uh, we thought of as a control uh, in, a, in a trial to irradiate this and so it would look identically, and that would be our, our placebo. Uh, and actually, in our pre-IND conversation with the FDA, they didn't like that control uh, because we needed to do a lot more science on the irradiation. But that's a, you know, it's it's, it's an, one idea. If I could just add, add one more question, it, it sort of <laughs> follows with Lita. <clears throat> when you look at, at germ-free animals. Their intestinal epithelial renewal rate is so much slower than conventional rates. And when you look at different lactobacillus, the studies that have been done suggest that there is a real differential in lacto and bifido um, intestinal epithelial renewal rates. So in a way, it argues that the commensals play a role in intestinal epithelial growth and renewal, and therefore that there's something about being alive bioactive that may have potential overall value in the fitness over time. But I would really, really appreciate a comment uh, from any of you on that. Okay, very quickly, time for one response. Well, I mean, if you use a germ-free mouse, remember they never saw any microorganism, uh, at least bacteria, we're not controlling strange relief or virus. So uh, when you introduce a, a, new, a new bacterial strain, there is a profound host response that you could see. Uh, but we're not germ-free. If we introduce lactobacilli in our system right now, I doubt you're going to see this massive epithelial response because you never saw, the immune system never saw it, your epithelium never saw it, you don't have a biofilm formation, M uh, mucin is not there, very little, so the interaction is totally different. Maybe if you have a C. diff patient prepared for, for transplant where you have massive uh, round of, of antibiotics, maybe they're going to get some, 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 you know, proliferative response. I'm not sure if someone looked at that, but in terms of germ-free mouse, this is a transient response, profound response, and after that, you get into, you look at the germ-free mouse that is colonized with one box or cocktail of bacteria. It's really similar to a complete uh, a biome, and then they, they just regulate their proliferation status, and everything is, is comparable. So it's a transient response. All right, um, let's call that a wrap. Uh, thank you very much for everyone who participated in this discussion. Thank you very much to our organizers, our speakers, and the trillions of microbes that have kept them well-fed and healthy for the course of the three days. <laughs> Please go home. You guys are busy.